our next presenter was a front runner for the Dutch Pirate Party, and um, she is now a privacy advisor for startpage.com. Uh, the, the talk for, is about the lessons of the past five years when she was fighting for digital rights at Bits of Freedom, which is the Dutch equivalent of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, please welcome Ancilla van der Leest. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining my talk tonight. Um, this shot is a, a very special occasion for me because it's kind of a, a five-year anniversary for me of, uh, of my privacy activism. I started in uh, 2012 when I joined this community and uh, tried to fight for our uh, common ground. Um, so I'd like to share with you my lessons of the past five years. They haven't always been pleasant, but I do try to keep it positive and share with you some knowledge that maybe you can use in your own life. So I started in 2003 uh, with my own uh, com uh, internet company because I was quite a technology optimist. Like I saw all the possibilities that te te technological advancement and the internet had to offer. And, um, you know, being a young person and seeing all these opportunities, I didn't think twice and just jumped on it. Um, and it was a beautiful time, and it was really a time when the internet was still uh, kind of new. It wasn't all around us. It was kind of a, internet was kind of somewhere. Like, you had to go there. You had to log into a computer and find your way around. There was no Google, there was no Facebook. Uh, there was no Twitter, so it was very decentralized. So you had all these nice little niche hubs that you could join. And the niches would never meet. So it wasn't so simple as you would just type in a name in the computer and get all the information out, it, out of it. Uh, it was much, much more mysterious, and so you much more had to work to find your way around it. Um, and that was something I really enjoyed. Um, then one day, after 10 years of working as a, as a model through my own website, um, I got a really bad uh, throat infection, a really bad ammonia. And being self-employed, it was quite an inconvenience because it actually put me in bed for like a couple of weeks on end where I couldn't talk. And, you know, having to make phone calls and stuff just wasn't an option. Like, I literally had to just lay down and wait for it to be over. So naturally, I was very bored, and I started reading a, on a topic that had my interest for quite a while, uh, which was privacy, and developments in privacy, and uh, namely digital rights. So I started reading and reading and reading, and after like two, month, two weeks of this reading, I kind of thought, we're in this most incredible time when we have so much freedom, so much liberty, we have access to so much information we've as a um, worldwide we've never been in this situation before where you don't have to be rich or privileged to have access to this much information like literally anything you want to know is on the tips of your fingers and I started to realize that and it also became kind of apparent that the powers that be are not always too happy with that development and you could kind of see the cracking down of a free internet and the uh, conversation starting of how good is all this freedom that we have. Um, namely the case of Chelsea Manning, I think we can all remember clearly, where she leaked her video through WikiLeaks, collateral murder, and she was deemed the criminal because she had made information public that should belong to us considering it's our tax money that pays for, essentially, war crimes. Um, so I started realizing, like, what a unique time we were in, we are in, and that if we didn't fight for the right to keep access to this information and to have the freedom of reading whatever you want to read without being constantly monitored, 
this was the time to fight for it. And after that, my ammonia disappeared, but I couldn't really go back to just running my fun little company that I was truly enjoying and making good money with. But I really felt like, okay, I grew up with the liberty of the internet, and I'd really like the next generations to have that as well. So there was no turning back. Now, standing here, five years later, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> um, and uh, it's been a, quite an uphill battle. Um, we've had some gains and uh, a couple of disappointments, of course. Um, and I've tried a couple of different avenues of fighting for a similar goal, uh, freedom of information and digital privacy. So I started in 2012, after I recovered from my ammonia. Uh, I joined the digital rights organization, Bits of Freedom. Um, I'd been supporting the work for a while, and they'd asked me to host a, a t-shirt contest before. Um, and I saw that they were really struggling to get in enough donations to continue their work. And they literally said that out loud, like, if we don't get enough donations, we can't continue our work. Um, so I, shoot, I shot them a, a message and I said, is there anything I can do to help? And I said, sure, you can like retweet and stuff. I said, well, I've already done that. I've already donated. Um, is there anything more I can do? I feel like you're lacking a bit of communication with the people who, sh who should be supporting you. So can I help? And to my surprise, I said, all right, join us. So I did. Um, in my mind, this was like a learning, a learning experience, and I was just trying to help out a cause that I felt strongly about. I signed for uh, uh, six months, and it was very clear from the start that I, I would go on and go back to my regular business after six months. However, um, does anybody know what significant thing happened in 2013? Snowden. Two weeks after I quit uh, Bits of Freedom, I was in New Zealand and I got all these phone calls and messages online of people saying, there's this guy, he's in the news, you would really like him, you really like his message. I'd been talking about government surveillance for uh, quite a while, uh, and people would think that it was overblown and uh, a bit of a conspiracy thing, but now Snowden came out and Lo and behold, there it was. So all of a sudden, I got a lot of messages from people saying, oh, darn, uh, you might have been right about that government surveillance thing. This is kind of worrying. So I was planning on going back to my regular job, but from this moment on, once again, no going back. Um, the lessons that I learned from Bits of Freedom that I want to share with you is powers in the numbers because I really noticed that for every lobbyist Bits of Freedom sends to Brussels and talk to politicians, you're literally up against an army of Google lawyers who get paid royally and are not ashamed to throw a lot of money into nice dinners and favors to politicians. And that is really like a very unfair battle because it's basically one lawyer for all of us against an army of lawyers for a corporate that doesn't even reside in Europe. Another challenge that we had was accessible language. When, you, when you're working with an NGO that has mostly uh, lawyers, um, that language tends to be pretty highbrow. So it becomes really uh, difficult to communicate with people who are less educated or simply not as smart um, and talk to them in a way that you can educate without talking down to them. This was really uh, pretty, uh, pretty difficult and I think it's something that we still haven't really resolved uh, as a community. Um, another thing I ran into was ignorance of politicians. I hosted a workshop in Parliament, um, How the Internet Works. Literally, this was the name of the workshop, How the Internet Works, just the basics. Because you gotta start somewhere. And it was just absolutely shocking how little politicians uh, knew. Not only that, um, 
they're actually quite scared of the topic because they know they know nothing about it. So they're scared to join, and instead of telling people what to do, getting, uh, getting told how things work. Um, and I was quite shocked uh, how, how little they knew and the level of knowledge uh, within Parliament, which later motivated me, of course, to do something about that, which I'll get to later. And funding, as I already mentioned, um, you're really dependent as an NGO of favors of people and getting in donations. Um, and then do you spend money on communicating that you need donations or do you spend money on like doing work? And it's like a pretty fine balance. <clears throat> then there's the, um, the issue of um, taking money from clubs like Open Society Foundation, where you kind of have to wonder like at a certain point in time when one institution funds all of the civil rights organizations, um, are you not posing a risk uh, just by being dependent on one, cat uh, one foundation? This is something that, in my opinion, is not talked about enough. Accomplishments that we, that we had were absolutely raising awareness. It's small steps and it's really uh, difficult, but um, every step in the right direction is a step in the right direction. Starting the conversation, like simply having a spokesperson be on TV when something happens and explaining what the deal is and explaining why civil rights and digital rights are important. And also legal reference point. If you want to know a uh, what the ins and outs are of a certain case or like a new law that's being passed, it's really nice to have a platform that you can refer to that you know has really checked out their stuff wh really well. So, closing the chapter of Bits of Freedom and all the challenges that it posed, um, I wanted to continue my fight, but in a different way. I felt like it needed definitely a little bit more ass kicking, a little bit more activism. I was lucky enough to be asked for a couple of different political parties, and after going through the, um, uh, their documents, um, I settled for an unlikely choice, namely the Pirate Party. Um, I think this kind of stemmed from my experiences with Bits of Freedom, where we always had to be very polite and nice and uh, not very uh, ac activist. Um, because you are talking to politicians and you do have to wear a suit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I felt like, no, I, I feel very strongly about this. And sometimes, you know, you want to uh, take some risks as well. So, uh, and I also felt it really needed like a new political party because the establishment was not going to take this uh, uh, topic seriously. I could kind of already tell when talking to uh, older politicians. So I joined local politics, and our, our slogan kind of was, politics needs nerds. Um, and this was actually quite a, quite a fun time, because we were quite a small team. And uh, <laughs> we were quite a small team. And uh, there was quite a lot of trust, because we knew each other well, and it was easy to visit each other and like go for meetings. Um, so at the time, it was a lot of work, a lot of hard work, uh, but in hindsight, it was actually quite a breeze compared to <laughs> national politics. Um, so the lessons from that is small team cooperation will bring you much further, quicker. So when you're on a deadline, it's really uh, easier to have a small, um, uh, small team of people that you can really trust. And maybe you don't like every single one of them, but at least you know their weaknesses and their strengths, and you can delegate a little bit. On a local level in politics, turns out voters are really up for an experiment. They're not as afraid to lose, to put everything on the line. So even though the Pirate Party has less uh, policy proposals on a local level, you find that voters are more open to trying something new and trying a different thing. Um, so it was really easy to go and talk to them and convince them that maybe the Pirate Party was a really good choice. 
Um, and we also found that media was quite sympathetic with us. They kind of thought we were kind of fun and gimmicky and new, and they were reporting around the clock uh, on, on politics, so we were kind of a fun story to take along. And especially the, the media that was trying to be hip and edgy gave us a lot of attention, which, which was great. So the accomplishments that we had was our, actually our first pirate got elected uh, on the local level of Amsterdam West. For the uh, city council of Amsterdam, we were actually short of uh, two, uh, 182 votes, which is like nothing. That's like one day of flyering, one radio interview, one house party, something, like one extra volunteer maybe. That was it. So it was, on one hand, we were really happy that we really did accomplish the first elected pirate in, in Holland. Uh, on the other hand, short of 182 votes, that really hurts, I can tell you. <laughs> um, another accomplishment that we really did have was it was really easy to form bonds with uh, other organization and groups that were fighting for similar causes. So, say the commons um, community that is fighting for, uh, for the commons uh, ethics. Um, we have a good cooperation with them because it was really easy to get to know them. Um, and bonding with voters, simply going door by door, being in certain places and flyering and people seeing your face, really helped to create like a bond and, uh, and trust. So, politics local level was a nice appetizer. <laughs> we accomplished a few things. We had fun, it was great. Um, and after that, I actually left to Berlin for a little while um, because the info security community in the Netherlands is very small, to say the least. And I noticed that even some of my Dutch friends were moving to Berlin because there's simply more of a community feeling there. Um, and because it's a cheap city as opposed to the big cities in, in Holland, there's more room for experimentation and there's less pressure to make a lot of money. Um, so, hence, more uh, room to, you know, be experimental and fight for important causes that might not make you money. Um, so, Berlin. Um, I, will get, I will come back to that uh, in a little while because there were some important lessons uh, in there that I'd like to share with you that are quite connected to the community that we're sitting here with today. So, 2016, um, I wasn't actually planning on uh, being a front runner. It kind of just happened that way. Um, I was asked to join the debates, and I did, and I thought it'd be valuable for, the for our party to at least have debates between different options of being a front-runner. Um, to my surprise, my personal favorite uh, as a front-runner stepped down and, asked, and actually basically asked the pirates to vote for me. Um, I really wish he'd consulted with me before he did that. <laughs> So, um, uh, so there I was. I was now a front runner for the for the pirate party after being elected by the uh, uh, by our members. Um, beforehand, I wasn't sure if we were going to make it, but I kind of figured it's absolutely worth the fight. We have to at least try, and. Worst case scenario, I will have learned a lot, <laughs> which I can't lie, that's true. <laughs> um, so this was our campaign poster. Uh, we had some other ones as well with the eye patches, um, which uh, caused a, a huge debate whether it, this one, was this one too serious, were the other ones too silly, were we being too subversive or trying to fit in too much. Um, it was really hard to uh, <laughs> to please everyone. Of course, you never succeed. Um, so the lessons from that, um, there were a couple of ones, or a lot of ones, there were a lot, but uh, there's a couple of ones that I wanna uh, share with you today. Um, beforehand, I'd explicitly said that 
we should really make a choice whether we even wanted to talk to uh, mainstream media or just go full on uh, with an online campaign. Um, unfortunately, we did opt to kind of try to do both with a very limited amount of people, a small team. Um, and we quickly learned that the mainstream media um, was kind of proactively ignoring us. And even after the election, there were actually like a couple of articles in newspapers that said, hey, during the election campaigns, we talked about all the political um, topics, except for any digital developments, digital society and technology. Uh, so they, they even admit it themselves. Um, sometimes there was a call that said there were not enough women in politics, and then they would name the, the women, but they would just name the, the second woman on the list of, uh, like, a main sh uh, of like an establishment party. Uh, so that was kind of weird because there were two, uh, three, three new political parties, all three uh, of which had a woman as a front runner, and those were ignored. So that was really kind of interesting development that was going on there. Um, in the end, I really wished we would have gone just for social media. And I think there was a small window of opportunity for that. Because you can already tell that there is no going around Facebook. You can't go without Facebook. Um, you can't go without Twitter. You have to be out there, even on the platforms that you are actually fighting against, because otherwise you're, you're simply invisible. Um, however, Facebook is making it harder and harder to um, be visible to your audience, even if they liked your page. They're still, tr still trying to get you to pay to even be noticed. So I think we're going from platforms that were pretty, pretty clear cut. You have a profile, people like your page, and they get updated with whatever you have to say, to basically uh, Facebook through algorithms deciding what they allow their users to see and whatnot. And in some cases, like actively pushing you to pay to even get your message out there. So I don't know what that's going to be like in the next election cycle in four years. Because I really wonder like, if even online, there won't be that much room for new parties that simply don't have so much money to throw to uh, pl uh, platforms. You can imagine in the case of being the pirate party, even paying Facebook for a sponsored advertisement is of course a huge debate. It's like a huge uh, moral debate within our party. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. We eventually opted. Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah, we eventually opted um, for a couple of ads that we thought were really important. Uh, but it felt. I can tell you, it felt really, really, really wrong to give money to Facebook to fight them. Um, another challenge that we ran into with the Pirate Party was um, organization. Because, you know, uh, pirates are nerds and hackery types, and some of them can be quite anarchist. And that's one of our strengths as well, that we have a lot of uh, stubborn uh, uh, fighting people who, who, think, who like to think for themselves. That really is one of our strengths. At the same time, it becomes a challenge to get everyone together, especially when it's a, l a larger group of people, say 2,000 pirate members, to all head in the same direction. And also at a pace and with some timing, that is complementary towards each other. Um, eventually, we found a way to do that. It's called a holarchic uh, system of organization, which I think it really um, holds a lot of potential for organizing activist groups in the future. 
However, when we discovered that this system was even out there and, an op and a possibility, uh, it was a bit too late to truly implement it within our party. So this is why it happened that a lot of our pirates were very uh, kind of stale and not participating through the uh, election campaign. And then the last two weeks, uh, individual pirates had organized so many um, uh, things, basically, uh, that we didn't get attention for any of them because there was simply too much going on. Uh, because I guess last minute, everybody woke up and thought, oh shit, elections is gonna be in like next month. Uh, I better organize something. <laughs> so, um, it was also, you wanna leave people free to uh, come up with their own initiatives. Um, at the same time, you have to keep them accountable. Sometimes there are certain, uh, certain events that are being organized that don't fit necessarily with the other pirates. And it causes a huge internal conflict because some pirates are simply more left-wing and others are more right-wing or more libertarian. Um, so that brings me to the polarization and the nuance of the message that you're trying to bring across. When there's a lot of pressure on and so many people trying to communicate a message, um, it's really hard to do that without being polarizing and to, while keeping the nuance. Um, so, for example, uh, in the last month, there were a couple of pirates who really wanted to join the Women's Rights March, um, which was also a little bit of an anti-Trump march. That was hugely unpopular with the other half of the pirates, who didn't feel at all, um, uh, who couldn't identify at all with the Women's Rights Movement. Um, so that was one thing. Another thing was, we've often been accused of being a one-issue party digital rights. Um, and that was sometimes held against us as, uh, as a negative. As a matter of fact, I think that with a new political party, it's really smart to be a one-issue party. And you can come much further with that. Um, as has been shown by the Dutch political party, the Animal, animal Party. Um, the name says it all, they're a political party, they fight for animal rights, and have actually been hugely successful in 10 years time. And now they're big enough that they can elaborate on their basic principles. And that is really something I'd like to see for, maybe not the Pirate Party, but a digital rights party, that it is a one issue party. At the last minute in our program, some things were added about um, uh, durability, sustainability, and uh, the environment, global warming. Um, and again, that was a topic that was not at all supported by a huge number of pirates and caused a lot of internal conflict. Um, in hindsight, it was added to the program, but we didn't actually have the knowledge uh, the deep-seated knowledge that we do have on digital rights issues. Like when we go into the, the realm of debate with other politicians, we have no insecurity that we know exactly what we're talking about and they know very little. Um, that is not the case with environmental issues. There's a couple of parties that are very well read on environmental issues and they're just much better at winning that debate. So why would you even go into that contest? Um, another thing that happened, which uh, is a bit gruesome, but I do want to share it with you because I think it touches upon a lot that's going on in our community. When I was uh, running for about two months as a front runner, um, something happened with the Berlin Pirates where one of the elected pirates in Berlin um, killed uh, himself and uh, a colleague of his in a pretty gruesome way. Um, and obviously it was uh, quite a shock to us, uh, not in the least because I just lived in Berlin for a while and um, I didn't know this person personally, but I did know a lot of people that worked with him closely. And I'd always also been asked to join the Berlin Pirates and I'm really happy I didn't say yes to that. 
So um, this was quite a shock to us because we had known within the Dutch Pirate Party that there were some people who were uh, having psychological issues and you kind of tend to hope that it just goes away. <laughs> and having a brutal murder of one of your teammates, uh, not only involving himself, a suicide, but on somebody else, a completely innocent person, was, at least for me, a pretty brutal wake-up call. And I pushed pretty hard within the Pirate Party to have uh, a counselor or at least somebody that you could go and talk to if there was something going on or if you suspected that somebody was not doing well. The worst thing about this Berlin thing was that people had known that this person was carrying um, some mental issues with him for a long time and they asked him to leave, but never had anybody really put his foot down and said, listen, uh, you have a bit too much issues and it's dragging the rest of us down and it's actually becoming kind of dangerous. So um, I really hope that, I know there's a lot of people in our community struggling with uh, depression, being bipolar, et cetera, et cetera. And I really hope that we can have this conversation in a more serious matter and talk, about, uh, talk to, uh, to each other about what happens when you see that somebody is struggling and how to help them. And also when you feel like maybe they're posing a danger to somebody else, how do you handle this? Do you kick somebody, in this case, out of a political party? Or are you just happy with the volunteers you can get no matter uh, how challenging they are to collaborate with? Um, all right. Last week, a uh, Dutch girl from the Pirate Party, after a long battle with addiction, um, drowned in the canal in Amsterdam. And she was a very uh, devoted volunteer for a party. So this is an issue that's not going away. And uh, I think we should really not wait with this conversation. All right. That was a bit heavy-hearted, sorry, but I did have to throw that in. Um, we did accomplish a couple of things. Um, we forced other political parties in our political campaign that they had to talk about digital rights or at least take a stand. And a couple of parties jumped on that and I actually got a promise from one of the politicians from the other parties, D66, that he was going to be the pirate in parliament. So I'm keeping an eye on him and hoping that he lives up to his promise. Um, the party of animals uh, all of a sudden started saying that they were the, the political party that uh, was best for privacy rights and they were fighting hard for privacy rights. Um, as soon as they got elected, they actually installed a law that said that in slaughterhouses there had to be cameras on employees always everywhere. All right, I'm all for animal rights and like all against like animal abuse, I find it absolutely abhorrent, but there must be better ways to, run to do that. Um, and we definitely raised awareness on these topics just to show that there were alternatives uh, other parties out there that you could vote for uh, that had new and fresh ideas. So what now? After five years, I started in 2012, after five years of fighting the battle for uh, freedom of information and uh, digital rights, I have some ideas on how to go forward. And I'll share with you what I'm going to do with my life <laughs> and hopefully inspire you to see what you can do in your life if you do find these topics important. Um, and you don't necessarily want to go down the exact same road that I've been going down. <laughs> um, so the solutions going forward. When I first started, there was a lot of uh, talk about we should organize crypto parties and we should educate people. I've really come to find that that is uh, a battle that it cannot be won because Simply programmers and consumers, they do not speak the same language and there's not enough money going around in all these uh, projects to um, add like good, good design or um, 
educating uh, or like help desks, et cetera, et cetera. So sure, you can download uh, PGP or like Thunderbird and implement uh, encryption. But then when you run into a problem and you're not a techie, as a matter of fact, maybe you don't even like technology. It's just something that you just have to do besides your job, your kids, and getting a mortgage. Um, and you don't know who to call or who to ask because none of your friends are using, using any of that either. Uh, it becomes a real pain because you can't just go to your, you don't always have the time to go to your local, local hacker space and say, hey guys, I have this little problem. <laughs> um, so, um, I really find that easy to use tools that, that, um, that protect privacy for consumers uh, with basically the click of a button, uh, that is up to us to develop. Um, we cannot ask users to simply put hours and hours of time into learning something that, uh, that is probably not up their street and they may never truly understand. Um, information accessibility. I really ran into this with Bits of Freedom um, where people would call us just simply for information. And for the longest time on Twitter, like I felt like a live help desk. Like I would get so many questions. I could literally, I should have put up a Patreon account and just asked money for it, but I didn't. <laughs> but I, you can really tell like once people start to t think about the topic of privacy and they want to do something about it, they have so many questions. So that is the thing. And then community building, taking care of each other, uh, making sure that we're doing well, um, and also um, making sure that we have good guidelines on how to handle things that uh, come on our path. Um, I'm going to say something that might be unpopular, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I'm pretty not so pleased with the way Shah has handled the Jacob Applebaum um, uh, story. Um, I find it a little bit too easy to spread rumors without any actual factual evidence uh, and ban somebody completely from a community. Um, I find that when these accusations take place of sexual misconduct, it's a very serious conversation that needs to take place, but it shouldn't be one-sided. You shouldn't be able to point a finger at somebody and say, I don't like the, this, the way this person is behaving, and then have them completely excluded from a community that they have contributed a lot to. I don't think this is the right way to move forward, because tomorrow it can be any one of us. So I'd really like to ask the uh, Shah Commission to uh, re-examine and reevaluate on their decisions in that. Part of community building, trust. Um, so right now, I'm a privacy advisor for startpage.com, which, as I said, I think is one of the solutions, having super easy tools for consumers. And I was totally surprised that Startpage has been around for 10 years, and it's a really great um, alternative for just typing in a search in Google, because it does give you Google search results, but it doesn't send all of your data to Google. Um, it's really as simple as just going to the web page, just like you would do with Google. Um, and I'm so surprised that many people don't even know this exists. So I'm going to work hard to change that for the next few years. And um, I, I think there's definitely something like uh, gateway tools, like Signal, Start Page, like very easy to use tools that make people feel like, oh, there are things I can do relatively easy to protect my digital information, and it doesn't cost me any extra time or anything. Also, I feel like the more products are out there that are easy to use and protect privacy, um, are, uh, that are privacy by design, the, uh, the bigger the chances that other companies will start doing the same, and there will be some healthy competition on this topic. Um, building stronger communities. I'm an advisor for, I'm almost done. Chill out. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a privacy advisor for the Beehive Tech Campus in Arnhem, which is on the other side of the Netherlands. Um, um, and this is a former Panopticon prison. 
which we are in the running for adopting as basically a huge hacker community. Um, we'd really, there's all these uh, things in the circle here, are those windows are all prison cells, uh, and they can be remodeled to be actually, <laughs> you're laughing at the irony of this, aren't you? Yeah, being in a panopticon prison and fighting for freedom. That's basically our goal, so. <laughs> um, so all these uh, former prison cells can be remodeled to have rooms to rent. And in this way, you can actually invite people from all over the world uh, to collaborate for a couple of months on, say, privacy projects um, and have it be fairly low cost and build up a strong sense of community um, that doesn't only have the technical know-how, but also carries over the ethics behind all of it. Um, if you'd like to know more, look up Beehive 42. Um, and I'm working on my own information platform called OPQ uh, for opaque, um, because I feel like there's really a necessity for having a central place where there's a lot of information around privacy and also offers a couple of solutions. It's just really get the conversation going. Um, and for people who have questions, there's an easy place for them to go to. Um, I've been tweeting about this topic for many years, but now, of course, all that information, I mean, it's out there, but it's not archived. So um, I'm hoping to work on a little bit more of an archive for the uh, for next uh, five years. Um, offering fun solutions. So there's, um, there's actually some clothes and stuff that are for sale now. Uh, I think I saw somebody here, I think, she, there you go, with like a, like a, I don't know if that's like an RFID jacket, I've seen them around, where you can basically put your phone or your uh, cards in your jacket and it offers an RFID protective layer, um, so not, not to have your data stolen. There's also like paparazzi scarves where you put on a scarf and it's decorated in a way that if there's a flash on it, uh, you can't see your face. So people, like creative people, artists and designers are coming up with like some pretty innovative ways to fight things like uh, facial recognition cameras. Um, so I really think that we should show that sometimes it can be fun to think about practical things that uh, might appear boring at first sight. And I'm really hoping to um, uh, educate people about the fact that privacy is a lifestyle. Privacy is not like a, a button that you can click on and off. It's like a thousand small decisions that you make every day. When you go to the store and they ask you, can I take your postal code? Do you say yes or do you say no? When you take your children to school and they say, oh, we took a lot of fun pictures today and we put them on Facebook. What do you say? Um, when you go to the doctor and they say, uh, are you okay with putting your information in the el electronic uh, patient file? Um, are you gonna f are you gonna say no, or or what do you do when you get a whole list of questions that are all very nuanced? Maybe it's like uh, um, many questions a day that you need to have an answer to, or at least should have thought about before. So, um, my talk started with be smart, safe, and happy, and. I'd really like that we go into a future where we, s we, uh, we keep human rights values within a technological realm. And we don't see s the separation between technolog tec technology um, and, and human rights. Um, uh, I also think that we're going increasingly into a world where everything is connected on the internet, with the internet of things with all your, your files being stored digitally, where the, the divide between real life and online is no longer there. Um, and I really hope that we <laughs> find better ways to deal with uh, using fun platforms and sharing economy without being a victim to the surveillance capitalism platforms. Um, I really think we need some strong European alternatives um, I'm really happy with the new GDPR regulations in Europe that are taking place now, and I hope it will bring some really strong financial in incentives to come up with better solutions. Um, 
be smart. Like, being humble is usually the smart way to go because very often when we as a community try to educate people who are not as technically savvy, um, they feel, they already feel stupid for having to ask and for realizing that they don't know and they don't know that much about this topic. So being really humble is absolutely key with this topic. Um, and you know, trying to offer where you can, uh, offer to help where you can. And another tough lesson for me the past five years has been that I now really truly believe in focusing on the positive because everything, uh, everything you focus on grows bigger. The more negativity you bring in your life, the bigger it gets. And uh, I think it was Mother Teresa who once said um, that she was invited to an anti-war uh, protest. And she declined and she said, you know what, if you name your protest a pro-peace uh, protest, I will, I will join a pro-peace pro march. Um, and I've slowly come to realize that there's some real truth in that. Like, if you tell people Facebook is bad, where are the alternatives? What else are they going to do if they want to keep in touch with family overseas? Um, so I hope we can really focus our energy on positive alternatives um, until they get so big that we just don't need all that stupid surveying shit anymore. <laughs> And be happy, because hey, you only live once. <laughs> or maybe not, we'll find out eventually. But, um, you know, you're here, and it's important to have fun, otherwise we're not gonna last. And, you know, be, be okay with yourself that you're doing what you can, and trying to make the right choices, and helping where you can. And you're not gonna save everybody, and you're not, maybe not going to accomplish all the goals that you have in mind, but it's really, really hard to be able to look at yourself in a mirror. It's really important to look at yourself in a mirror and be able to, to say, I really did my best to fight for something that I believe in. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Well, you can ask me questions now or find me on Twitter if you're shy. But I don't bite, so. Any uh, questions from the audience or suggestions for Antilla? I think they're all tweeting now. They're like. Hi, it's Arikia from New York. <laughs> um, so having worked in the not quite mainstream media for the past 10 years, I can't imagine what a horror show it must have been having to deal with them for something that your career depended on. Um, so. I wanted to ask you, what can legitimate journalists do, who are less and less in the mainstream media, but still here, uh, what can we do to help with digital rights activism globally? Yeah. Uh, from my point of view, like fighting for, for a really important cause, and being in the pirate party, and being completely ignored by mainstream media, it makes you pissed. Really. <laughs> and you ki I kind of had a hunch before I started the whole project, uh, but it was much worse than, than I, I... It was so blatant. It was so blatant, so rude, so... I mean, it was I just insane. I had to next to those people for years. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, I don't want to bitch too much about it, because I do realize that a lot of like genuine, well-meaning journalists are really trying hard and are on insane deadlines uh, smaller and smaller uh, pay, um, more freelance, no job security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I realized that journalists are also really having a hard time. Um, I think we have an opportunity right now where if you are genuinely doing a great job, your work will be seen. Um, there are some platforms, some technological platforms in development which I think you know all about. <laughs> so I think technology is part of, so of the solution, and right now we live in very interesting times where you can actually set up your own donation platform and literally ask people to donate for your article if they find it valuable. And that is, of course, an opportunity that journalism has never had before. And I think it will, in the, in the end, it will probably kill large titles 
Uh, and I hope more power to small journalists who are like really sticking their neck out to bring a good story. Thank you. <laughs> Ask for money. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> we have a winner. Hi, I'm Case. You touched upon a, a problem I would summarize as herding cats. Uh, I think it's a big thing in the hacker community, also in open source. Lots of competing pro projects trying to do the same thing. I think with Piratenpartij, you have a, a unique challenge there and experience, and you told a little bit about it, but maybe you can tell a bit more. Do you have any tips on how to do that? Yeah, so I, I did briefly touch upon it. Uh, fortunately, I can't really elaborate right now, but there's a very interesting system called holarchic, uh, holarchy. Holacracy. Holacracy, exactly, yeah. in English, yeah, holacracy. Um, and I actually went to a course to learn how to set this up. And I think the basis of holar holarchy is that you make people accountable not for the person, it's really, really important to see the person separate from the function that they're doing. So that when, you, when they're doing something wrong or something goes away, you can talk to them in their function instead of talking to them as like, you're uh, Henkia and I, I don't like you personally. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. The case is you're Henkia and you are on, um, press, on the press phone and you're really doing a shitty job. Of course, you should pose it more politically correct than I'm doing right now, which might explain why I didn't make it as a politician. <laughs> but um, it's really, that's really, I think, the key. And also, you know, as a community, you need to be strong and you need to really just have the balls to tell somebody, I'm sorry, but you're just not doing a good job. And usually, the worst part is, Usually these people who are occupying a space that they're really bad at are really good at other things. So they're not only are they occupying a space doing something they suck at, they're not doing the thing they're great at. So it's a w complete waste of their talent and, and their resource. Cool. Yeah, I'm implementing all accuracy in my, my company. I think it's great for organizing existing groups. Yeah, exactly. Well, hopefully... Yeah you can do some talks on that and like, because I think we really, as a community within the Pirate Party, but also just activist groups, we really need it. Thanks. Thanks. I think it would be great to have a talk about that. Anyone else in the audience have a question or suggestion for Ancilla? No? Can I have a warm well, uh, applause then, please? Thank you. <laughs>